Hello, everybody. Good good morning or afternoon, um, or possibly evening if you're doing this overseas. Um, welcome. In the year 1932, musicologist and professor Wilfred Parrott told an audience during one of his lectures, nobody has ever made heads or tails of ancient Greek music, and nobody ever will. That way, madness lies. The problem here lies in how little surviving material there is. A few scraps of musical notation, a lack of published theory or instruction. Um, most songs, it seems, were never written down at all, but were learned by ear. And while Greek writers like Plato and Aristotle had vigorous debates about what music should sound like, deciphering their philosophical terminology and trying to back construct what songs actually sounded like is an entirely different question. Maybe Wilfred Parrott had a point. This way madness lies. I mean, just take a look, if you don't believe me, at this chart put together by modern scholar John Chalmers. Um, this is about how the Greek notational system worked. Um, do you understand any of this? Because I don't. Uh, I'm not really sure anyone does, in fact. I think Parrot was right all along. Or uh, how about this one? <laughs> Anyways, with all of that in mind, I'm going to try to explain what ancient Greek music was actually like and why it mattered so, so much to them. And, as an extra, why it might be useful to know for any modern composer, musician, or music fan. So that's what we're going to do. My name is Aidan Gray. I'm a PhD student at Cambridge University over in England. I uh, focus mostly on Greek ritual and religion in the Archaic period, which, as you might expect, was a very noisy place. Um, hymns, musical instruments, dances all feature prominently. Um, and that's kind of how I got into this, kind of via that angle. The first thing I want to look at, before anything else, is the sheer ubiquity of music in ancient Greece. I don't think I'm speaking hyperbolically when I say music was absolutely everywhere in the ancient world. If you want to understand ancient Greece, you can't afford to write off the fact that musicians show up everywhere on base paintings, in literary epics, histories, and in philosophical tracts. There was no part of Greek life untouched by music, and they have gifted us with so much vocabulary for it, right? Most of the basics and the building blocks. Um, you know, we think of like Italian as having given us a lot of musical terms, like, you know, for, for tempo markings and things like that. But if you go even more basic than that, things like chord, melody, harmony, rhythm, mode, tone, um, chorus, chromatic, lyric, hymn, these are all Greek words that meant essentially the same thing to them as they do to us now. Even the word music right, comes from the word musike, which I have up here, uh, which means the domain of the muses. There's a band of apparently professional musicians equipped with all kinds of different instruments depicted on the Aya Triada sarcophagus, which was made in 1300 BC in Mycenae, which is basically as old as you can get for Greek culture. That by itself is not very surprising, right? The ancient Egyptians depict uh, musical performers, usually harpers, um, plucking these you know, massive harps in their, in their wall paintings. Um, every civilization, at least as far as I'm aware, has music. What the Greeks did, though, and what makes them so fascinating, was that they subjected music to a process of rigorous scientific analysis. They wanted to understand music, to argue about how it should work. The Greeks were the first people to investigate the link between music and mathematics. Um, the ancient Greek mathematician Pythagoras, who you probably know better as the triangles guy, um, was famous in his day for developing a new system of tuning that people still have to learn about in music school, though we don't actually use it. Um, he essentially founded the science of acoustics and you know, wrote about string vibrations and the relationship between that and pitches and things like that. Music was baked into the Greek education system as well. According to Plato, every child learned exactly two things, gymnastics, by which he meant all kinds of physical education, and music, which meant basically playing uh, on the lyre. Um, we'll talk about instruments in a second. But, uh, and everyone would learn to sing in the Dorian mode, which is the simplest uh, Greek mode. 
Now, most people would go on to study other things later on. They would study, I don't know, uh, medicine or philosophy or something like that. But um, a few would continue with music and could actually become um, fairly wealthy that way uh, in the ancient world. There were lots of competitions for professional musicians um, to compete for cash prizes. And Greek citizens would turn out in huge crowds um, at places like the Odeon, for example, which was a theater just for music um, built by Pericles, who's a famous Athenian politician. This actually isn't the one built by Pericles. That one doesn't exist anymore, but it's a, it's a copy of it. So. so fundamental was music that Plato writes very confidently that when music changes, the modes of the state change as well. In other words, music can affect or alter the very way a nation operates. Very cool stuff. But anyways, yeah, now that I've mentioned it, let's go back to this notation chart for a second. I don't want to just kind of flash it up here and then move on and, and, and never talk about it again, because I actually think it's a pretty good place to start. Not actually explaining the chart to you. I'm not interested in that. But you can see here that the way the Greeks approached music was, unlike everybody else, completely systematic. Everything had a name and a symbol and a number. And part of what makes it confusing, I will admit, is there are actually two parallel Greek notational systems. There's one for uh, musical instruments, and there's another one for the human voice. Now, traditionally, in the Western world at least, composers think of the human voice as just another instrument you can choose from. In other, you know, like, you know, violin, piano, voice, they're all kind of equivalent in terms of notation. Um, that's not true in the ancient world. To the Greeks, the project of singing lyrics was extremely different from the project of, you know, playing a harp or something like that. And that has some big ramifications that we're going to talk about down the road with, with lyrics. Uh, another important point about notation, and actually the reason that their notation system is, is frankly a mess, is because um, pitches are, are, are uh, sorry, notes are relative. In other words, they're not pitch based. So for us, like, okay, like a, you know, a C, you know, C note is, is just a pitch that represents a, a vibration and a frequency, and, and that means something um, uh, absolute. That's not true in the Greek system. These are not pitches, these are relative instructions. So, like, go up one half tone or something or go down by a semitone they're they're relative to the previous note and usually only the first note in the sequence is actually given a pitch value or it isn't and you just have complete flexibility choosing where to start which is very interesting i think but it does make uh the notational system kind of a mess um i should also mention greek music especially early is what we would call microtone um, have you ever heard that term before? I, I just want to check. Some, I know some of you are musicians, so hopefully you know. What do I mean by microtonal? You can, you can, sorry, you can either raise your hand and, and unmute yourself, or you can use the chat if you'd like. I think it's usually easier to, to just raise your hand, but um, chat's also fine. Or if you, is that the second tone that plays? I don't know. Uh, good, Michael. No, um, not uh, exactly, unless you do mean this, and I'm not quite reading your answer right, which is possible. Um, Basically, microtonality means that they divided up the octave with more divisions than we have. Okay, so um, think of it this way. The Greeks had notes in between the, the notes of, of a, like a modern piano, okay? Um, and that by itself is not that unusual. Um, Turkish and Arabic music, is, is they're both microtonal. They have more fine distinctions between notes that, that we don't have. Um, but it can make some Greek music sound a little weird to us because things will sound like not tuned properly because it's actually falling in between two notes, if that makes sense. So I just want to give that caveat at the beginning. But actually, Greek music abandons microtones in about 400 BC and switches to basically the same divisions of the octave that we use now. So, and that's not a coincidence, by the way. It's, it's because they ended up with that system that we have it now. Uh, yes, let's, let's now hang on a second. We've talked about some of the incredible technical detail Greek music can get into. I want to take a digression into something I think is a lot more fun, and that's rhythm. Now, there, are no, there is no surviving Greek music that has tempo markers, unfortunately. Um, they just didn't do that, as far as we know. And of the very few surviving pieces, note durations are really rare. Um, only, only a tiny fraction will actually show you how long to hold a note for. But that fact is because 
note durations are actually built into the lyrics instead. How is that possible? Well, the Greek language, unlike English, has what are called long and short vowels. Latin has this too, if you've ever taken Latin, that's why I asked earlier, but uh, it doesn't seem like we have that there, which is fine. Basically, you can have a vowel that takes the normal amount of time to pronounce like, oh, that's just the normal amount of time. Or you can have a vowel that takes twice as long to pronounce like, oh. In Greek, these are called omicron or small o and omega or big o, okay? And this is true for most of their vowels. You can either have it normal length or twice as long. What this means in Greek is that by arranging long and short vowels in a specific sequence, you get a natural rhythm to your sentence. One way to think about this, this is not a perfect comparison, but it's, it's pretty good, is to think about iambic pentameter. So if you think back to English class, hopefully you all have taken one of those at some point. Um, English writers like Shakespeare very often write lines in iambic pentameter. Um, which means they alternate stressed and unstressed syllables, right? So when I do count the clock that tells the day, that kind of thing is a is unstressed stress, unstressed stress. Um, and what this does is it, it kind of gives like a natural rhythm to the sentences. Greek poetry works in a similar way, except they don't really have stress-based uh, syllables, but they do have length-based syllables. So they would be alternating long syllables and short syllables, if that makes sense. In fact, it's probably easier if I give you an example of this. So let's look at the first seven lines of the Iliad. Um, that's them in, in Greek. It's basically saying, uh, you know, saying about the wrath of Achilles, which sent many Greeks to Hades before their time and left their bodies as the spoils for vultures. Um, for this was fulfilling the will of Zeus. It, it doesn't really matter. What I want you to do is listen to the Greek. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to really exaggerate the long and the short syllables so you can hear the natural rhythm in this poetry. So um, I guess, have a listen. Men in aye de thea pele i adio achileos. U lo menen he muri a caios alge a feke. Polas difti muspsu cas a idi proiopsen. Pero o now tus de heloria tel kepunesen, oyo noisi tapasi, dios de tele etobule, ex hu de ta prota dias de ten eresante, atre ides te anaxandron kai dios ahilos. Okay, so that's what it sounds like in Greek. Now, Hopefully, and again, that, that was not what it would have sounded like. I'm very much exaggerating the long and short syllables so that you can kind of hear how it works. Um, now, one thing you've probably noticed there is that Greek poetic forms are not quite as rigid as iambic pentameter is. Um, and English poetic meters, we tend to like it when every line has the exact same rhythm. That, that's a very English language thing. Not the Greeks. Um, the Greeks, they wanted freedom to do way more variation than that. So like you can replace a long syllable with two short syllables, or you can replace two shorts with a long. Um, and that way you get to vary your lines, which means each one is slightly different. It would be boring, the Greeks thought, if every line had the exact same rhythm. Um, and so being able to kind of mix them up is a sign of a good poet like Homer. Um, and as you can see, none of those seven lines are the same. They all have different um, rhythmic patterns. But hang on a second. I hear you say, I can, I can hear things. Why are you talking about poems? A poem isn't a song, is it? Well, yes, actually they are to the ancient Greeks. We think of poetry as a sort of literary thing that you read in a book, but that's not what poetry meant in the ancient world. All of this stuff was performed. And I don't mean like at a poetry slam, I mean like sung with musical instruments and melody. All poems, yes, every ancient Greek poem was a song. And once you understand that, suddenly I think the world of ancient Greek literature becomes a lot cooler. The Odyssey, let's take as an example, um, which one of you mentioned having read recently. I don't remember who. I'm, I could scroll up and find it, but someone read The Odyssey. The Odyssey was 24 separate songs. You probably saw them described as books 
in your copy. Um, but that's not what they're called in Greek. They're called um, rapsoides, which means, well, a long song. <laughs> it's 24 songs stacked together about the exploits of Odysseus. It was never intended to be read by, you know, cracking open a book in a library, although, of course, I do recommend that. The words and the order of the words was chosen for their sound, for the internal rhythm, and to accompany the melodies, which we don't really have anymore. But if you ever come across something where you're like, that seems really strange, just consider the fact that it's possible that it made more sense if you happen to have the original melody. I'm going to play a quick link here, and I, I really hope I can get the sound to work so you guys can all hear this. But um, some people, of course, uh, have tried to reconstruct what, uh, sorry, the, um, what ancient Greek songs would have actually sounded like. So this is the same seven lines I just read to you, right? The Iliad, the first seven lines of the Iliad. I'm going to play, not all of this, don't worry, but this is a, a professor, Stefan Hegel, um, singing them and playing the harp pretty much the way he thinks they would have been reconstructed. I think he's pretty accurate. So again, this I, want, I just want to stress, this is not actually some piece of Greek music we have found, but it's a pretty scholarly and I think pretty accurate reconstruction. So um, give a listen and let me know if you can't hear anything and I'll try to like fix a zoom, but um, here you go. <laughs> Okay, that was just the first seven lines, um, but like I said, that's what I really wanted to... Um, um, okay, so again, like I said, that's that's what sort of the epics were, were, would have been sort of delivered like, something like that. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, but now we've been talking about epics because uh, they're a lot of fun and they're something that most people have actually heard of, at least the, the Odyssey or the Iliad, the, you know, um, what is the Iliad? Does anybody want to summarize what, what is the Iliad? Not quite as famous as the Odyssey, maybe, but what, what happens in it or what's, um, what's it famous for? Anybody? Or is, does, does, does no one, has no one heard of the Iliad before? Or? That's very fair. Unlike the Odyssey, um, there aren't a lot of clues in the name, uh, or at least not unless you know uh, Greek. Um, the, so the Iliad is about Achilles. It's it's the story of Achilles, his his sort of final weeks, uh, you know, uh, battling with Hector, the great Trojan. It's it's the it's one episode from the Trojan War, basically. So if you ever you know that's what the Iliad is about. Anyways, these are epics. But what about other genres of Greek poetry? Well, in addition to epics, they actually had this huge genre of poems that are called lyric. Um, it, it's where we get the word lyrics from. Lyric poems in ancient Greece are short, descriptive, they're often love songs. Um, and uh, you can see, I, I just put a couple here that I think are, are pretty famous. Um, you can see these three. They wouldn't need a lot of work to be modernized, I think, in a lot of ways. You have um, it's very famous Sappho fragment 16. Some say an army of cavalry, some say of you know dark clad heroes, some of swift ships on the sea is the most beautiful thing on earth, but I say it is the one whom you love. And unfortunately, then the fragment cuts off there, but uh, so it goes. And Acreon is another great writer, as uh, you know, I am perhaps in love, or maybe not, and I am crazy, or possibly no unknown author, drink with me, be young with me, love with me, wear crowns with me. You see, Greek lyric poems it wouldn't need a lot of effort to be modernized, I think, in a sense. And, and, um, and uh, yes, I'm just stressing this now because um, when we think of Greek poetry, we tend to think of the stuff that we often read uh, in classes, which tends to be the epics or the, you know, <coughs> things like that, odes, you know, things like that. But, but there's this entire genre of, of song lyric type poetry that I think is instantly more understandable and recognizable as music lyrics. Um, I think that's quite cool. 
Now, there's one more feature of the Greek language I do want to talk about very quickly because it has a cool way of interacting with music. You may have noticed that these Greek words have accents on them. Uh, this is just a random sentence. It very much doesn't matter what it means. What I want you to look at is the three different kinds of accents um, that are uh, on display here. There's the one that goes up, there's the one that goes down, and then there's this one over here in the, in the sort of middle of the sentence that kind of looks like it goes like a, like a tilde key on your keyboard. You guys see those three, the three different kinds? Yeah. Um, now, ancient Greek was a tonal language, um, right? Okay, so the same way uh, modern Chinese is, although Chinese has, I think, like eight tones and Greek only had three, um, so it's slightly simpler. These, these things that I'm calling accents are actually tone indicators. So uh, an accent that's slanted up to the right, that's a rising tone. So you make your voice go up on that. Uh, the one that's slanted down, that's a falling tone. So you make your voice go down on that. And then the one that's like kind of a squiggly line that you go up and then down. So it's a, fall, it's a rising and then a falling tone. Um, this is just to be clear the way everyday spoken Greek works. This is not like uh, just for poetry. This is for normal everyday Greek. But in songs, you now have the choice as a composer to make the melody agree with the natural pitch. So that would mean like having the note go up on a, on a, a rising tone and go down on a falling tone. Or you could set them against each other and have the melody do something opposite the natural pitch action. Um, which you know could be really interesting if you're doing something sad or angry or you know otherwise wanting that discordant effect. Interestingly, when Roman writers talk about Greeks learning Latin, sort of native Greek speakers learning Latin, they often sort of poke fun at them for uh, you know speaking uh, Latin as if they're about to start singing a song. Um, apparently, ancient Greek sounded very sing-songy to sort of um, their their neighbors, and it's it's probably largely because of these pitch accents. Okay, we're doing a lot of technical stuff about, you know, we've talked about notation, we've talked about the lyrics. Um, let's uh, take a break and talk about something I think is pretty much just fun, and that is the instruments. Um, Greek musical instruments are very cool, um, and we're going to start with the string class of instruments because they were by far the most popular um, and, and the most frequently depicted in art and things like that. Probably the most famous Greek instrument, like if I, if I really tried to make you name one. I think the one that most people would come up with is the lyre. It comes from the Greek word, the lura, uh, which is a small harp that you strum. So just in case you were curious, people get this wrong all the time. You don't pluck a lyre, you strum it, like kind of like a guitar, actually. Um, the idea of the lyre dates back to literally ancient Sumer. It's like 4,000 years older than the Greeks. But they really took it and made it into a symbol of poetry and therefore art and literature itself, because all poems were at least accompanied with a lyre. Lyres are small. They have to be you know, easily handheld in order to be a lyre. Um, and so they're, they're perfect. And they, they have no soundboard, I should mention as well. So they don't have great amplification. Um, so they're really ideal for small rooms or, or just a few people, very kind of intimate settings. You can think of them as like, basically the equivalent of acoustic guitars of their day. Everyone had one. Most lyres have four strings, although some of the more higher ranked professionals might have six or seven, maybe. There's a very fun, very cute mythological story about the origins of the lyre, where um, Hermes kills some of Apollo's cattle and is trying to apologize to him. So he, you know, invents this sort of lyre and gives it to him. And Apollo is so happy that he, you know, doesn't punish him because now he can sing his poetry and stuff like that. Just a fun story. But okay, fair enough. Let's say you don't want to play to a small room. You want something more stadium capacity. Okay, that would be something like a kithara, which is actually where we get the word guitar from, kind of coincidentally. See this guy in the top right? That's a reconstruction of a kithara. And you can see a kithara is like a lyre, but they're huge, boxy, and they have a soundboard, which means they can be much, much, much louder. All the ancient sources agree, lyres are very easy to play. Everyone would be able to, you know, strum a few basic chords, but a kithara needs a professional. That's, that's a much more complicated instrument. 
They're also strummed, and you need a pick for it, which they made out of dried leather. Um, lyres can only accompany singers. They're not really good on their own. They don't sound that nice on their own. But a kathara plays on its own, so you can do instrumental music on a kathara. Kitharas almost always have at least seven strings, um, sometimes more. And they have a deep uh, sounding box, which is slightly arched in against itself, held together with wooden ribbing. And the reason I mention that is that's a very sophisticated piece of technology for 500 BC. Um, you know, in, in the West, a lot of our musical instruments really only developed in sort of the 17th and 18th and even 19th century. Um, but the Greeks had a, a pretty sophisticated piece of, uh, of, of sound going back to like 500 BC, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, Apollo is often pictured holding a cathara. This one in the bottom left is a very famous picture of, of um, Apollo with a, with a cathara. There's all kinds of other string instruments as well, though. Those are only the two most popular. Um, one of my favorites is the barbiton, which is this thing. It's drawn in the bottom right-hand corner. The barbiton is kind of like a bass lyre. It has deeper, lower strings. Um, and it came from Persia. And the, the name barbiton literally means barbarian thing. So, you know, they were happy to adapt stuff from the Persians, but they weren't, uh, they weren't always very nice about it. And there's the helis, which it has a round sounding board, kind of like a banjo. Uh, there's the epignion, which is the only one that you pluck rather than strum. Now it has like 40 strings, so it's a lot more like a traditional kind of like Irish harp or something like that. Uh, and, and there's literally like at least 10 other variations. So again, uh, you know, harps were really important to the Greeks. They had almost limitless variety here. I want to show you just very quickly this picture um, down in sort of the, the bottom middle of the sort of three women playing um, stringed instruments. I, what I want to point out here is these are three very different kinds of instruments. The woman in the middle has a cathara. You can tell because it has a deep sounding board. The woman on the right is playing a chelis, which again is made out of a rounded tortoise shell. And the woman on the left is playing an epignion, which has like 40 strings and is more of a traditional harp. So again, you can combine these um, different instruments in, in unique ways, which I think is very cool and uh, worth, worth mentioning. You got to have some percussion too, um, and uh, the, the Greeks certainly did that. Um, in addition to regular drums, which they called tympanum, it's the origin of uh, the modern word timpani, uh, you also have tambourines are very popular, which is basically just a, a drum with, with bells on the edges, right? There's also a special religious group called the Corybantes, who are known for their kind of ecstatic music. Um, which is usually described as being, you know, frenzied or frantic or something like that. And the Cori Bantis have all kinds of special percussion to themselves. For example, something called the Roptron, which is what this guy over in the left, that's supposed to be the Cori is there, you know, going on a procession or something. Um, but that's, that's a Roptron in his hands. Um, and what it is, is it's a, it's a drum that's stuffed with bells on the inside. Um, and so to the ancient Greeks, they thought it sounded kind of like animal noises. It sounds very wild and kind of crazy. Uh, they also had this thing called the crotalum, which is this woman in the bottom right. She's drawn holding them. Um, a crotalum is just a castanet, so it's exactly like Spanish castanets, if you know them. Um, there's sort of a little drum that you clap in your hands while dancing, which is how they use them as well. And then this instrument in the middle I want to talk about a little bit too. Um, this is called a sistrum. This thing that looks like it has like three lines going through it. What that is basically is a rattle. Um, I think it was like ancient maracas, but these weren't used in music. These were only used in religious rituals. Um, and so you, this is not something you're like playing to sort of keep time with a, you know, a cathara player. This is something that you're sort of rhythmically shaking while doing animal sacrifice or something like that. Um, what I love about them though, is they were actually adapted from Egypt where they have a uh, really kind of an insane name. I'm gonna try to say it. I always get this wrong, okay. The name of this instrument in ancient Egyptian is the Sesheshet. <laughs> I find that very difficult to say. What that is, you'll notice, is onomatopoeia. That's what it sounds like to shake these maracas. It sounds like, you know, Sesheshet, something like that. So I think that's very cool, naming an instrument automatopoeatically. That's, that's pretty cool. If you happen to be a big fan of brass fans, for whatever reason, uh, you'll be a little bit disappointed to know that the, the Greeks weren't. They had exactly one kind of trumpet, and it sounded like death. Uh, it's called the salpinx, and it's this very long bronze tube with a mouthpiece made out of bone. 
not very complicated. Um, like it is really just a tube. Um, but they could get very long. The longest salt sphinx we've ever dug up was a meter and a half, which is five feet of bronze tubing. These were exclusively used in battle, as far as we can tell. These are not instruments that you, you know, play for fun. There was no, you know, Miles Davis. These were for rallying the troops and for, you know, things like that. Oh, and the start of the Olympic Games. You would, you would play them to like, you know, it's like a starting gun, basically. Um, so, yeah. Let's end by talking about the wind instruments, which are my favorites. You'll see why. First of all, you got the pan pipes, which are obviously named after the god Pan. So there's him over on the left there, the, the woodland, you know, satyr Pan with his pan pipes. If you did not know that's where the word pan pipes come from, now you do. Very cool. And there's the aulos, which is my favorite ancient Greek instrument, bar none. And the aulos is what the rest of these pictures are. Um, an aulos is a set of two very thin tubes made out of bone. Uh, and with, they have a reed mouthpiece. Kind of like an oboe um, is sort of the best equivalent, although as you'll see, not, not exactly like an oboe. Um, <laughs> the aulos was associated in the ancient world with three things. Lamentations, the Olympic Games, and sacrifices to Dionysus, which I think you'll agree is very much a mixed bag of associations. One of the reasons I think they're so interesting. Plato wanted them banned, actually, because he thought they're sort of shrill, very uh, jarring noise would, you know, inspire people to do bad things, which makes them kind of the ancestor of the modern Vuvuzela, I think, in, in some way. But what makes the aloe so interesting to me is the way they're constructed. These two tubes actually have literally different notes that are available to them. Usually they're offset by a whole tone. So one can go slightly lower and the other can go slightly higher. But you have to share the melody across them. Um, and what that means is while one tube is sort of you know, producing the, the note, the other acts as a kind of drone. Um, and so what they sound like really is like a cross between a clarinet and the bagpipes. It's very weird. Uh, they don't really sound like anything else. Um, and they have a slightly distorted sound that comes from being made out of bone, um, not, the, not the purest conductor of sound. Um, so they, they're like a little, um, they have a buzzing kind of sound, which makes them almost like a kazoo, uh, if you can believe that. Um, but that's why they were associated both with funerals and ecstatic worship is because they're naturally distorted. Uh, they have like a di real distortion effect on them, which obviously I think is very cool. Oh, and the aulos is responsible for one of my favorite jokes in ancient Greek theater. Um, but it was a joke that nobody understood for literally millennia. So naturally I'm gonna have to take a digression and explain that. Let's begin with the concept of Greek theater. Um, the Greeks invented theater, right? And they hosted these competitions every year in tragedy and in comedy. A few of these plays survive and are still read and performed today, right? Antigone, Atlas Rex, um, the Oresteia trilogy, possibly you've come across some of those in, in class before. What people often forget is that these plays were musicals. They were all performed to be sung each excuse me, each speech or block of dialogue had a, its own melody. And they would have been accompanied by musicians playing stringed instruments, pipes, and drums. So now Aristophanes, who is an ancient Greek comic writer, writes a play called The Frogs, uh, in which the chorus is represented by a bunch of frogs who are also aulos players. And for a long time, people just read that and thought, well, I guess Aristophanes is being a bit silly. That's kind of random. I don't really know what that's about. But then recently, when we started reconstructing the aulos and, and you know, making modern versions that people learn to play, it turns out the technique of circular breathing, of, of you know, having these things that you need to play, it does kind of make you look like a frog. You can see you really have to kind of get your cheeks puffed out in order to play them. And that's the whole joke of this play, The Frogs. That's, that's the joke. Um, that's it. Uh, the Frogs is an interesting play, actually, because the plot of it, if you've ever read it, is basically a poetry contest in Hades between the two greatest Greek playwrights of the time, Aeschylus and Euripides. And the debate between them, some of it touches on their actual writing, like their, you know, word choice and their, their ability to develop characters, their moral lessons that you learn from the plays. 
But the debate also touches on the actual music that their plays were set to, um, which suggests that ancient poets and playwrights were probably both composer and lyricist, or librettist, I suppose. Um, so this debate is literally as old as recorded music itself. Aeschylus gets criticized for being very wooden and unemotional, just having kind of lots of repeated lines, being sort of technically good, but not having a lot of feeling. Whereas Euripides, in turn, is criticized for having this kind of wild, emotional approach, and every line is in a different style, and it's, it's all kind of excessive. Um, I, I'm telling you, there is no debate in ancient Greek music that you cannot find slightly modified in a 21st century YouTube comment section. All of these debates are still ongoing in some way. Um, Plato has a big thing in book two of the Republic about whether immoral lyrics contribute to bad behavior. Again, that's something people are still very worried about. Um, there's argue, arguments about technical ability versus emotion, about old versus new music. People have you know, their favorite and least favorite performers. It's all um, intensely relatable, I think. Oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention probably the most technically advanced Greek instrument, although it wasn't one that was used very often, if at all. Um, and that is the instrument called the hydraulis, which is actually an ancestor of the modern church organ, believe it or not. Um, but uh, like I said, it has some problems. Let me explain it. The hydraulis was invented by the barber and physicist Thesibius, which is already quite a fun job description. Uh, he became the first head of the first ever museum in Alexandria, which is also very cool. So he was the first museum guy. But Tisibius also wrote a treatise on pneumatics, um, arguing that you could use compressed air in tubes to do all kinds of things. For example, build cannons or send things places. Um, unfortunately, no one picked up on his research for about 2,000 years even, which is very unfortunate. Um, otherwise, we would have had like I don't know, pneumatic tubes in the Middle Ages. That would be, that would be cool. But uh, yeah, no one, no one listened to Cassibius. Anyways, one of the things he did with compressed air to prove how powerful it was, was he built a musical instrument that was essentially a set of pan pipes on top of a wind chest that was then powered by uh, basically hourglass of water. And as you turn the water things over, that forces the air into a tube, which pushes it along the pan pipes, and you can manually open or close the ones you want to sound. This is very advanced. It is, however, a little complex. It's a little bit fiddly. You need two people to operate it, and one of them is just flipping uh, bottles of water over and over, which is not very fun. Um, According to the stories, Tessivius and his wife would alternate. So one of them would play and the other would push the water over and then they'd switch. It's very cute. I like that story. That's, that's good. Uh, the instrument never became standard in the Greek repertory, though, because it is kind of a pain for that other person. And uh, it also has only one volume setting, which is extremely loud. People said it was like uncomfortable to be near, so it didn't really take off. Like I said, that is the basis of the technology that would form the modern church organ, only they use a bellows instead of water. So it's less bad, basically. Okay, what I'd like to do in this next part of the class, we've, that's instruments covered. I wanna talk about the three surviving examples of, well, the two surviving examples of Greek music and one guy who I think is really interesting um, to kind of give you a cross century approach to uh, what this music actually was like. Let's start with the singer-songwriter Timotheus of Miletus, the Elvis Presley of the fifth century BC. Now, earlier I mentioned that archaic Greek music was microtonal. There are lots of very fine distinctions between notes, uh, which can be kind of hard to sing. It's also instrumentally very simple. Back then, before Timotheus, you had three string lyres rather than four. So Timotheus comes all along, adds a string to the lyre, which dramatically increases its range. Right now it has four strings instead of three. And he also tends to write shorter songs, right? Greek music before him was all about the epics. It was all about Achilles and Odysseus and Hercules and these kind of big military themes. It was all about war. And Timotheus is not into that. He's, he writes, um, he has a lot of songs about uh, madness and insanity, actually. He's very into that, and suffering is another thing he really likes. But the point is, 
he's really shifting it to be about emotions. These kind of brief songs that are about feeling uh, with much more complicated music because he has a fourth string now. But the other thing he does, he starts moving away from microtones into just half and whole step intervals, um, which, which makes him a lot easier to sing than, than, than other people at the time. Also, I'll note this, I think it's kind of funny. His Greek is considered very sloppy, like he makes a lot of grammatical errors and has kind of weird um, phrasing for things sometimes, which got him a lot of heat at the fourth century. And also now scholars still say, oh, you know, his Greek is not very good. Um, I think it's kind of funny because again, I mean, I think that's still a thing people complain about in you know, the song lyrics, but anyways, I want to show you a verse from one of his songs, which I think is, is interesting. And I love the translation this guy did, Armand Angor did it. Um, and what he does, he preserves a lot of the rhythm that the original Greek lyrics actually had, right? Which I think is cool. So here it's, I don't croon in the old way. My songs are new and better. See the old king, Kronos ousted. Now the young Zeus is the ruler. Get away old fashioned music. So he's part of this movement. He actually founds this movement that we call in ancient Greece, the new music. New music is non-microtonal. It has more instrumental stuff going on. Um, and it focuses on emotion and feeling rather than the old mythological wars and heroes of the past. So that's the new music. Really uh, important milestone for, for Greek poetry and Greek music. And I think it's quite funny because I don't think this idea never leaves us, right? Once we've introduced Timotheus of Miletus, now you have you know, all of modern pop music that's essentially that. Um, so again, really important guy. No one, no one thinks of him, but like without Timotheus of Miletus, you know, who knows? So kind of an important guy. Unfortunately, none of his melodies survived. So we actually don't know what any of them sounded like, which is a bit of a shame. Um, well, let's move on. If we go to the end of the classical period, 600 years after Timotheus, we have a very special artifact. This is from about the year 140 AD. It's called the Saikalos Epitaph. Well, uh, I mentioned earlier that the vast majority of Greek music was never written down, which is true. We only have a few examples, but this is one of them. This is an example of an entire composition which has both lyrics and music. Um, it probably wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that this one artifact completely revolutionized the field of understanding Greek music. Um, it is the oldest composition that survived in full, like from anywhere in the world, although you'll see the reason why is it's actually very short. It's only like one verse long. Let's talk about what, what is going on here. So, all right, this guy called Sekalos, who is a singer, um, sets up a, his tombstone in Ephesus when he dies. And he was, a, as I said, a professional singer and songwriter, and he wanted people to remember him for his hits. So what he does is he carves on the tombstone, on the front side, a little inscription, and on the back side, one of his songs. And the front side reads, I am a tombstone. That's really what it says in Greek. Sekulus placed me here as a long-lasting sign of undying memory. If you think that sounds very serious, um, it actually isn't. There's actually a pun in there, believe it or not. It's the word long lasting, which um, literally means in Greek, much time. And that also was a term of musicians used. It was, a, it was a technical term in the field of music that referred to having um, music that had lots of different rhythmic patterns within the lyrics. You can consider it like polyrhythmic, almost like kind of the same idea. Hopefully that gives you some idea into the, the character of Sekulu. But what's really amazing, as I said, is he wrote out the pitches. If you guys look on the look at this image on the right, which is kind of zoomed in on the text, uh, in the bottom half of it specifically, you guys can see. Okay, that's that that is Greek writing. But then above it, do you guys see those little letters with with weird glyphs above them? Those are pitches and durations. And look, I'll I'll um, just go to the next slide. Really quick. Let's come back to this in a second. That's what it looks like if you uh, and clear it up from inscription Greek into regular Greek. And what that means, because it has note values and durations, we can very easily reconstruct it in like modern Western notation. So there it is. Um, 
Does anyone want to hum it? I know I wouldn't ask you to sing it because I don't know if you know how to read Greek or not, but that's just a normal melody in a, a standard uh, Western key. Does anyone who knows music um, unmute yourself and, and hum this tune for us? Anybody? I realize it would be very, very brave, but uh, I'm... Nobody? But what I think is, is amazing is you took this tombstone from 140 BC and you were able to sing that because they wrote it with, with, with good notation. Now, I'm going to play a version of it performed um, with like period instruments in one second. But before we do, I think we should talk about what the song is actually um, about. And the, there's the lyrics. It's, as long as you live, shine. Made in Los Sulupu have no grief at all. Prosolionis um, titozain, life is very short. Totilos ho chronos apaite, and time demands its end. This is a drinking song, guys. I, maybe it doesn't seem like it to you, but that's what ancient Greek drinking songs are like. They're very much like, you know, oh, time is finite, so, you know, have fun while it lasts. That's what they're all like. This is a drinking song. Now, if you study it for a long time, you'll notice uh, a couple cool things about it, which I'll just tell you so that you don't have to. Um, for one thing, the word accents, that is the tones, always line up with the harmony. Uh, we did talk about this earlier, I know, but I said kind of as a composer, you have the choice. In this case, he always makes them line up, um, which, which again, to the Greeks would sound very elegant. That sounds very, very natural, very musical to them. But also the other cool thing here is it rhymes. Um, fainu, lupu, zain, apaite. Um, rhyme is not very common in the ancient world um, in literary poetry. So people like Homer, Pindar, they don't rhyme, never, not, not once. Um, but apparently for these kind of musicians, for, for basically pop lyrics, they do rhyme. And I just think that's interesting to point out because again, it's another sort of parallel that people don't really expect. Probably what it is, it was Sekulos' most popular song that he wrote during his lifetime, and that's why it's on his, his tombstone, is because it's like, you know, he, again, like I said, he wanted to be remembered for his hits. Um, another thing you'll notice, if you look at this for a long time, which again, I'm, I'm not saying anyone should, but um, the, the words make intuitive musical sense. Positive words, like words with positive associations tend to go up, and words with negative associations tend to go down. And again, that's something that we know to the Greeks, they thought that was, oh, that's very clever. That's very uh, good. But we, they like it when people do that. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you and which means sharing and uh, reshare with sound so we can listen to a version of this. song as was recorded on the tombstone i think what they do is they go on and repeat it a couple times to make it more of a real song but um but yeah it's 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 um it's a fun time i'm gonna sorry go back to share so we can get this powerpoint up uh okay yes everyone everyone back with me yes um excellent okay um there's one final excerpt i want to discuss from ancient greek music this is the most exciting of them for me um it's, it's probably the coolest and it's the oldest. It was written about 600 years before the Sekulos epitaph, um, which means it's about 20 years earlier than Timotheus of Miletus and the new music. So this is one of the only surviving examples of what's called the old music, so before Timotheus. It's probably one of the most exciting papyrus discoveries of all time. If you guys look in the top right-hand corner of the screen, that's it. Um, doesn't look like much. It's only about two inches square. Um, but what it is, is a fragment of a chorus written by the Greek playwright Euripides. Um, and right above those words, look, you can see the, the Greek words, and above it are symbols, just like on the Sekulos epitaph. Yes, those are notes. 
Um, not No durations, though. He didn't do that, but he did write the notes in. Now, the actual papyrus here was probably written around 250 BC, so, so a little bit later. But again, based on the music, which is slightly microtonal, we think it probably dates back to Euripides himself and the old music. So this is probably a surviving example of Euripides' own melodies. Very exciting. Now, unfortunately, the fragment is only six lines long. Um, it starts with this word, kataloforumai, which means, it's a little hard to translate. It means something like, you know, I lament utterly, or I, I weep thoroughly, or something like that. Well, what's going on in the play? So this is, this is from the play called Orestes, which you can read if you want to. Um, it doesn't really matter for your enjoyment of the song, but I'll just summarize it. Um, Orestes has just killed his mother in order to avenge his father's death. And now he's being tormented by the Furies, who are these you know, agents of, of uh, divine justice. And um, at this point, the chorus is singing a, a sort of an interlude about how human flourishing never lasts very long, which if you know anything about the Greeks, that's one of their favorite things to talk about. Um, and so he's, you know, they're saying, uh, let's see, flourishing is never secure among mortals, but like the sail of a storm-tossed ship plunges to and fro in the waves of violent affliction, as deadly as billows of the sea. There's a slightly different translation up here, but, but that's, that's what they're talking about. Now, as you might predict with those lyrics, um, the rhythm of the poetry is very frenzied. It's not like it's not like the epic one we read earlier that has a lot more stately rhythm. This one is very jarring and, and kind of, um, you know, discordant. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I'll, I'll just play. This is a group at Oxford. So they're, they're a classics department. I just meant this. They're not professional musicians. So don't um, go in expecting that. But they do a pretty good job at playing this, given that it is, as I said, slightly microtonal and a little bit weird. So this is the last um, fragment I'm going to play for you. I'm once again going to stop the share and uh, redo it uh, differently. So everybody just sit tight. Uh, Okay. Here we go, friends. The, um, the, the, the music actually cuts off at that point, so they just, they just speak some lines, but that's, um, you know, fair enough. Yeah, the instrument does sound like a kazoo. I completely agree. That's an aulos. That's what I was talking about earlier. It has, like, that slight buzzing noise because it's made out of bone. Um, and, uh, again, they associate it with lamentation because it sounds a little bit jarring. Um, I think it's very cool. Um, let me get this PowerPoint back up now. Um, and let's talk about the Orestes chorus. Uh, no, wait, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry, guys, give me, give me one second. Share. Uh, okay. Okay, I think we should be good now. To me, that's very cool to listen to. It sounds weird, and that's actually why. Um, it sounds weird if you're expecting modern Western music, at least, but maybe we shouldn't be. Greek plays, if you've ever read them, are very different from our modern conception of theater. They do things differently. And having the music gives us kind of some insight into why they're different and, and how they're different. But on the other hand, if you do adjust your expectations a little and you go in with open ears, how different is it really? I mean, I think that melody kind of works. It can get stuck in your head as it did while I was researching this. Um, and when you compare it to the lyrics, which I have in front of you here, um, there's very little doubt that it like works, I think, on a musical level. It's it's it sort of fits the topic. And this question of modern standards keeps coming up. And so I'd like to conclude by talking about, is Greek music an ancestor of modern music or not? 
basically, did you just waste an hour of your precious finite lives or not? Obviously, I think not, but um, critics are divided. Uh, in the in the okay in the pro camp, you could point out to the fact that all of the building blocks of Western music do ultimately come from the Greeks. And I talked about this earlier, at least in theory. The reason we think and talk in terms of scales, modes, tones, tuning, these are all Greek ideas and Greek words. But on the other hand, that's not because Greek music actually spread and influenced anyone. During after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Greek music was sequestered. Basically, Greece was cut off from the rest of Europe. Um, and uh, the people in the Western Hemisphere kind of developed their own traditions completely independent of anything that was happening in Greece. But when all of the music was lost for millennia, what did survive was the books about the music, um, essays and treatises, mostly by Roman authors. Um, explaining how the Greeks had sort of constructed their musical world and how they had approached that. It was on the basis of these books by Latin authors about Greek music that people started to create art music for the first time in the Middle Ages. But the anti-camp would argue that again, the music died out. Greece was separated from Western Europe, right? Um, and uh, you know, the musicians had an entirely different array of traditions. Well, with one exception, actually, and that is the Western church. The Western Christian church um, sang uh, in a way that was very Roman. It was a Roman way of organizing music, what we call Gregorian chant. Um, if you've ever heard that, that's, um, that's just Roman music, actually. Now, it's a little bit different from the Euripides chorus that we heard, obviously, for a couple of reasons. One, it's late, so it's not microtonal. But two, it, it's deliberately trying to cultivate a, you know, hymn-like, you know, sober, reverent atmosphere, which obviously the Euripides chorus isn't because that's not what it's trying to do. But my point is that when the Western classical tradition starts again around the year 1600, a big part of that development comes from the Renaissance, which means the rediscovery of Latin and Greek texts. People then who were just immersed in these documents knew something that we often forget now, which is that, um, the ancient plays had been sung and set to music. And it was in trying their hand at creating their own that you get the birth of opera, right? And so there's a reason that for the first 150 years, pretty much every opera is mythological, almost with no exceptions. And the reason is because they are trying to write their own versions of the ancient Greek plays, which they knew to be musical. And again, opera would, would, would go on to be, um, significant for the next 300 years in terms of developing all kinds of popular music uh, and, and, and other schools of music that were sort of popular in Europe and North America. I think that's a good case study in why I think Greek music matters. The, the actual songs were lost and the vast majority of them still are, but something about Greek music survived. The approach, the ideas, the spirit of Greek music, which has been kind of an enlivening force in Western music, really for the last thousand years. I think that's all I got. Um, questions, comments, some good stuff in chat. Uh, does anybody else have anything else or, or want to unmute themselves and, and ask any questions or say anything? And yet I just wanna thank um, everyone who's been participating in the chat. Thanks everyone for, for pointing out things that they thought were, were interesting or cool. Does anyone have any, any questions about Greek music or, or thoughts about this all?